Well, thanks, Ben. Uh, welcome, uh, comrades and friends, to the Lion's Den. Clearly, we are at uh, quite a crucial time in the uh, development of the labor movement. And uh, there's probably a lot of confusion, isn't it, out there? I think there was a number of delegates who were hoping that the tide could have been turned, that uh, David Evans could have been stopped, and there'd be some light at the end of the tunnel. But of course, uh, you know, give credit where credit's due. You know, the right wing are determined as ever, and will use whatever methods uh, they choose in order to get the ends that they want. I mean, uh, uh, I actually like history, you know. Uh, well, some of you know I wrote a book about Chartism recently, and uh, anniversaries, and of course this month, is the 90th anniversary of the uh, greatest betrayal in the Labour Party in 1931, where Ramsay MacDonald and a number of his cohorts stabbed the Labour Party in the back and joined a national government with the Tories and the Liberals, which conducted an onslaught against the British working class in the 1930s. And uh, I say that because you know, there are certain parallels we can draw. First of all, that uh, betrayal is not uh, new in the Labour Party, unfortunately. You know, the Labour Party was created by ordinary men and women to uh, fight for the interests of the working class. Uh, in 1918, and the impact of the First World War and the Russian Revolution, it adopted a clause called Clause 4, which was a, a socialist aspiration of the party. And uh, that was an aspiration of working people, if you like, the most politically conscious workers in Britain realized that the problems that the working class faced arose from capitalism and this system of exploitation. And until you get rid of that, you will never solve any of the problems faced by working people. And therefore, they aspired to the same because the Labour Party was taken over by uh, those who were interested in maintaining the status quo. In fact, when the Labour Party was born, the ruling class tried to destroy the Labour Party, tried to prevent the trade unions from financing the Labour Party. But when they realized they couldn't destroy the party, they thought the Nesbeth Mas thing was to take it over, infiltrate it, put in leaders into the party who would maintain a grip on the party and prevent it moving in that particular direction. And that's what we've had since Ramsay MacDonald. And of course, the events themselves condition the impact in the Labour Party above all else and the, and the working class movement. And uh, we're at the crossroads Really, insofar as the working class, I mean, we're, we're faced with the greatest crisis of capitalism for, three, for 300 years. See, the immediate crisis now of shortages in the shops, of shortages of drivers, of the impact of, of restrictions on trade, of supply chains broken up and so on because of Brexit, and et cetera, et cetera. The impact of the crisis is bearing, beginning to bear down and we haven't been asked to pay for the bill yet. 400 billion, if you like, has been uh, borrowed by the Tory government to bail out the capitalist system. Of course, the working class, as in 2008, 2009, 2010, and, uh, and, and the next 10 years that followed of austerity, had to pay the bill of bailing out capitalism. And of course, these uh, affect the workers. We've seen the way conditions have deteriorated. You know, we had the biggest fall in real wages in the last decade, since any decade, going back to the Peterloo Massacre of 1819. You know, we talk about the stress in work, the condition, deteriorating conditions in work in life. The fact you have to work longer for less. And all those at a time when science and so on should be giving us the benefits, you know, of these advantages, the possibilities that are there. But of course, capitalism is not interested in that. It's interested in maximizing profitability. 
and therefore the working class always suffers in the capitalist system. After all, profit comes from the unpaid labor of the working class. And that's why they squeeze the working class. That's why they are attack the working class. And of course, the Tory government, and now we've seen the new labor people are talking about the need to be responsible. You know, we have to balance the books. We have to be careful with the money. They're prepared in a way, if they got the power, <laughs> to introduce austerity as well. Because on the basis of capitalism, there's no other way out. But we have to understand what has been going on. I mean, uh, what we are facing, and I think everybody is aware of that, is an all-out civil war in the Labour Party. That's been going on for the last 18 months. Many of us will argue it's been going on for the last six years, ever since Corbyn was elected, where the interests of capitalism, which were concentrated in the Parliamentary Labour Party, this is the, the cesspit, if you like, where what you have in the PLP, the majority, of course, there are, you know, uh, comrades in the PLP who are far different and, and, and would side with us, but the vast bulk of the Parliamentary Labour Party are made up of careerists, are agents of the ruling class within the Labour Party. They are a fifth column within the Labour Party. Yes, they are a cancer within the Labour Party, nor in a way at the Labour Party for its own interests to maintain the party under the thumb of the establishment itself. Keep it harmless. Don't they let the Labour Party become radical, above all. Make it so it subverts it, so it doesn't subvert to the ideas of public ownership and socialism. And when Starmer talks about, yeah, we've got, we got to get rid of socialist appeal, ban socialist appeal, because socialist appeal and the Labour Party has different values, he says. Well, you know, we can, we can go along with that point to a certain degree. Socialist appeal does stand for certain values, certain traditions. That is the fundamental socialist transformation of society and the ending of capitalism once and for all. That's what we stand for. And that's what we believe is the historic mission of the working class, not only in Britain, but internationally, because it's an international question, of course. Whereas Starmer and the right wing also represent their own values. And those are the values of the market, of capitalism, of the establishment, of the status quo. That's their values. And therefore, they are back to the hilt, aren't they? Why are they so adamant? Why are they so aggressive? Let's be clear about it. As I said, give the devil his due, despite we're in this very religious uh, setting at the moment. The right wing are ferocious because they feel behind them the support of capitalism. They feel the support of the ruling class because they represent the ruling class. The papers, the media, the whole establishment supports the right wing in whatever they do to take on the left. And of course, the, uh, that's what gives them the courage, courage in inverted commas, of course, the determination to do whatever it takes. They don't care about democracy. They don't care about the rules. They, if they're in the way, they will sweep them away. And by the way, it's not a new thing. They always have done it. Witch hunting in the Labour Party is not new. It's been there for a long time. You know, in 1920, the Communist Party was formed in Britain, and they applied to affiliate to the Labour Party, because lots of other parties, the Independent Labour Party, applied for affiliation. Why can't the Communist Party? Because the, that was a danger, and, and the, the right wing blocked it. Although he could be a member of the, of the Communist Party and the Labour Party, yeah, paradoxy, right up to 1924, then the blocks came down. And then they developed anybody who tried to raise their head in the Labour Party, fighting for real socialism, was shut down or expelled, like Nye Bevan, 1939. You know, and many 
also lost the whip in Parliament, you know, for defying. I mean, the right wing doesn't bother with that. And that applies to the trade unions as well, by the way. You know, well, here we are, we've got relatively democratic unions, you could say. I mean, I, remember, I know, not fair, up until 1949, if you're a member of the Communist Party, you could not stand even as a shop steward or any official within the Transport and General Workers Union. In other words, there was a witch hunting atmosphere even in the unions. So the right wing have always had this, you know, they don't mess about. They, protect, they are there to protect the, their interests and the interests of capitalism itself. And therefore we have to know who we are dealing with here. And we are dealing with the direct agents of capitalism within the Labour Party and also they exist in the trade unions as far as the right wing is, are concerned. They're like that, as we know. You see that with Unison, although Unison's moved to the, to the left. Oh, no, they've now pulled the strings on the delegation and the general secretary in order to prop Starmer up and so on and so forth. So we know what these people are like. They're not Democrats. They never will be. And they're there to represent the interests the interest of big business and the establishment. Therefore, as far as I'm concerned, they are the enemy as well. They are the Tories in our ranks. And therefore, they should be treated as that. The idea of a, forgive me again, the broad church is a lord of baloney. There's never been a broad church. The right wing has always controlled the Labour Party. They can have a little bit of a left wing there, as long as the left wing are gagged. But the only thing this difference this time was in 2015. The heavens fell down. Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader of the Labour Party. One member, one vote. Hundreds of thousands joined the Labour Party. Three partners shot to vote for this man. Turned everything upside down. The Blairites had controlled everything up till then. They were on the way to destroying the Labour Party, by the way. And Corbyn, because he, he represented something different, against austerity, more radicalism and so on, touched the nerve and wham! It set off this huge movement of people into the party looking for fundamental change. Young people, look at Glastonbury, for God's sake. You know, Jerry's a little bit older than me, and there he was, a bloody rock star. Young people, look, look at this. Not because of Jeremy Corbett, <laughs> I don't think, but what he represented. It was something different against the old, bloody, corrupt, Two-party, three-party, whatever you like kind of system. twiddly e, twiddly dumb. You know, the Tories weren't doing too well. Get right-wing Labour in then to, to clear up the mess. Discredit them. I get the Tories back in then after they'd cleared up the mess. We know the game has been happening for a long, 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 long time. But the, the Corb Corbynism represented a fundamental day and a fundamental threat to the ruling class of this country. And the ruling class of this country, believe me, are not soft. They're vicious in protecting their power, their prestige, their interests, and their profits. And they will do anything to protect their interests. And that's why they decided that they would mobilize this fifth, fifth column in the Parliamentary Labour Party, and a few crumbs outside councillors, and goodness knows what, has-beens, to try and sabotage the Labour Party discredit Corbyn and in that way destroy Corbynism. It reminds me of this great film. I don't know if you've seen it. Spartacus. Wonderful film. I think it was produced in 1959, if I'm not mistaken. It broke the, uh, the blacklist in the United States. It was Trumbo, actually, was the, 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 uh, the scriptwriter of this famous film of a Thracian slave who led a revolt of the oppressed, of the slaves against the empire of Rome. And when Cracus, this senator, this general senator, was sent to defeat Spartacus with his armies, he said, I go not simply to kill Spartacus, but the spirit of Spartacus. In the same way, the ruling class didn't want to just get rid of Corbyn, they want to kill the spirit of Corbynism, root it out of the movement, destroy it, 
There are many parallels in history. When, James, when Charles II came to the throne in 1660, after if you know your history, 1649, Britain was a republic because we cut the head of Charles I off. We abolished the House of Lords, abolished the monarchy. You had a republic. But when the counter-revolution got back to power 10 years later, in 1660, they wreaked vengeance. And not only did they wipe out the Cromwellian period, and he declared his, his reign was from 1649 and not from 1660, they even dug up the corpse of Oliver Cromwell and hung him because of the retribution as an example or to the masses, to those who dare try and subvert the ruling class. And that's what they're trying to do in the Labour Party. That's a start. You can pretty fight for all you want. That's the aim. If they've managed to suspend Jeremy Corbyn from the Labour Party, they'll try and stop him standing in the next election. You can bet your life in it. No, let's not have any illusions, comrades. There is a counter-revolution going on in the Labour Party, which has not been completed yet, but they're trying to complete it. They've driven out, what, 120,000 members already. They've demoralized a whole layer of people. They've suspended and expelled and shut down and gerrymandered. You name it, they've done it in order to what? Purify the Labour Party. Destroy the old Labour Party. Destroy Corbynism for good. And to get it back, reclaim the Labour Party for capitalism as an organ that will defend the capitalist system. There's a problem in that. Because the unions as well, by the way, are affiliated to the Labour They help create the Labour Party. That's a bit of a contradiction. But nevertheless, that's their aim. To destroy Corbynism. Not 150,000. What was his name? Tony Blair. So we needed to get rid of 300,000 members of the party to cleanse it. And that's what they're going to do. That's, what they, that's the whole idea. And they've had some success, haven't they? And I think, look, I'm not here. I think uh, Jeremy Corbyn has been incredible in the way he has stood up in the last five years to the, to the rat bags and the saboteurs and the backstabbers who, who try to destroy him and, and, the, and the press and all. And the, going to the Parliamentary Labour Party, meetings on a Monday night, this bear pit. But uh, we made some mistakes. I say we, the royal we, the left. You know, there's no point in, in saying, oh, well, it was great and let's forget. And No, 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 no. We don't want to do that. Those who do not learn from history will be doomed to repeat it, says George Santayana. Absolutely correct. And in my opinion, because I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we shouldn't prettify things. We shouldn't sweep things under the carpet for, for fear of, I don't know, offending someone. Life's too short, comrades. And our mission is too great. We, you know, capitalism is in deep crisis. And, of course, the working class is going to suffer no end. But, of course, that's going to re re result in convulsions in the labor movement. The working class is not going to take it lying down. They will sooner or later need to mobilize. And I've seen it. I've been around a few. I'm not expelled yet. I thought, what's the, what the hell's the matter with them? <laughs> I've been in the party now for, what, 55 years? I've seen them come and I've seen them go. But... Uh, this time, they're, they're going for broke, believe me or not. You know, they, they got rid of Benism, they got rid of uh, Bevanism. By Christ, they're going to really go for the, this one because it frightened them so much. It terrified them. They lost control. They're never going to do it again, they say. And that's why they, and the left, my God, come on. Come on, learn some lessons. In, in fact, I would say, and I, I'm part of the left, although I was very critical, I thought we should have gone for the juggler. You know, not, let's not mess about. These people are agents of the ruling class. 
We should have gone for introducing automatic reselection of MPs across the board, straight away. And when Corbyn was forced to stand in 2016 for election again, I would have said to all those people, all those MPs who demanded it, OK, but all of you will do it as well. You'll all face a reselection as well in your constituencies. Yes, my friends. And momentum, if it had been worth its salt, would it have been, yes, yes. And we'll, we'll, we'll carry it through. Look, the members were desperate to change things because they, my MP is Margaret Hodge. God oh, fuck this. Uh, <laughs> so I know how, uh, how things can be. I know what the right wing are like. And I know that if the left-wing membership were allowed to do what they wanted to do, they would have deselected these people because they knew they, they were they were stabbing Corbyn in the back. Every, every two minutes, they'll rush into the press, the TV, and so on. They sabotaged the 2017 general election. They preferred a Tory government than a Corbyn government. They are, in my book, traitors. Traitors to the working class. Traitors to the membership of the Labour Party. Traitors to socialism. And I don't want to mince words. That is the reality of it. They shouldn't be there. But the, we need to, you know, the left should have realized this. You know, should have understood what we were facing. And mobilize instead. Oh, we have to be careful. You know, we don't, we don't want to split the party. We have to have unity. How can you have unity with people who are stabbing you in the back? We have to realize who the enemy are. And of course, you give your enemy a little inch and they'll take a bloody mile. And that's what's happened. They were allowed to coexist. They were allowed to spit in our faces. We would wipe it off and perhaps offer conciliation with a broad church. We need unity. Well, I was going to swear, but <laughs> not so. Not so, my friends. Not so. As far as we can do, we should say the truth, isn't it? You know, let's start from fundamentals. Tell the truth. And if you tell the truth, you can't go far wrong of what these people represented and why they should never be there. They are Tory careerists. And in the Labour Party, we want fundamental fighters for the interests of working people. That's what we want. And that's why it needs, we need to clear the stable out. Clear it all out. And that could have been done. But uh, I'm afraid even the left leaders were saying, oh, hang on. I know, because when we're closed for, we are a comrade up here at the back uh, here who moved a, a motion to bring back Clause Clause 4 in the Unite Policy Conference. Unfortunately, he has a phone call from Corbyn's office. Do not do it. We don't want it done. And as a result, the National Executive of Unite opposed it when they should have supported it. I mean, what is clause for? But the principles of socialism, for God's sake. And what do we have in our party card today? What's it about, you know, the market and, uh, and free competition and other bullshit of that order, which is in reality an acceptance of capitalism? We're, uh, we're against capitalism. Of course, not all are. You know, I always remember that favorite, she was on the radio, I think there was a name, uh, 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 Siobhan McDonough, is it? Member of Parliament, I think South, someone in South London, where she equated anti-capitalism to anti-Semitism. To be anti-capitalist was to be anti-Semitic. I mean, they were, draw, they were rewriting the rules, rewriting everything. Of course, the, the press and all that were all in favor of them. As uh, many comments would say, Christ, if Corbyn was leaving the Labour Party now, and all the things that are happening, 120,000 had left, and all the other things, they would have been howling for his blood. But because he represented, or what he, what did he, it was the aspirations he represented of, of the millions of people who were looking for something new. And that's what they feared, not so much Corbyn, but the forces that he had unleashed, the people, the, the forces behind him that threaten the interests of capitalism itself. And we have to understand, as, as a left, for God's sake, that we can't make those mistakes again. Surely, 
Because if you do, I mean, the idea of um, thinking that the right wing are part of the movement, or that somehow we can get into a nice little cosy arrangement with them, is pie in the sky. <laughs> They're interested in one thing that is protecting and preserving the position of capitalism in society and in the Labour Party. As long as we understand that, we know what we're dealing with. But if we blur it over, then obviously, and that's what was happening, we had to, like, to appease them. In some way, if you appease them, they'll, they, they'll be okay. But remember, you know, Jess Phillips, I won't stab Car uh, Corbyn in the back, I'll stab him in the front. And Lord Mandelson, I get up every morning, wanted to know how I can get rid of Corbyn. Of course, they're in the party, there's no problem there. You know, because the right wing look after their own. And therefore, yes, we made some mistakes because we had a chance, an opportunity, isn't it? Which don't come along very often to deal with these people. And we let it slip. And once you let it slip, they take... You know, weakness invites aggression. And the right wing are very aggressive. And now we have this wonder man, you know, Starmer and Evans, you know, who are now going to use their position in order to further, further the counter-revolution. Because what they've done, as far as I know, I know that, well, they've managed to, to secure the vote over the, of the general secretary. They're now going to conference, I understand, to, to push up the, uh, the, the threshold now of how many MPs are needed in order to, to nominate a leader of the party to 20%, which means, in, in these terms, 40 MPs. The left will never get 40, in my opinion. I don't know, you know, it's not going to be done. So they've sewn it up. And that's the state of play at the present time. Unfortunately, we are paying the price for our failure in the past. And we mustn't do that. We have to learn lessons. In other words, in my opinion, you fight fire with fire. He mustn't give it me an inch. We must, and that's... And we're not doing anything wrong. We, are, we say that we, we represent the interests of the majority of members who need more democratic rights to have greater accountability. It's as simple as that. And we go back to our, our socialist aspirations because we have the greatest crisis of capitalism for 300 bloody years. Capitalism cannot any longer afford reforms. It can only afford counter-reforms, taking back of all the gains that we have had in the past which we take for granted, are going to be ripped away from us. And therefore, people are going to be, will think, they will get angry, they will look for a way out. And that's where, if you like, we come in, that, we, that Marxism supplies the answer. Now, of course, there are, in the movement, we're not a, a majority, we're a small minority. The majority views in the labor movement are what we call left reformist re uh, views. That is the idea that somehow we could somehow you know, make capitalism work a bit more nicer. And we can get, get away with it, but uh, it's an illusion. It cannot be done. You know, otherwise it would have been done before. Every government in the world is facing the same crisis and the same austerity, the same attacks on working class people. And therefore, that's the main lesson we have to have, that our ideas correspond more to reality than their ideas. Ours correspond to the needs of the working class. And as far as we are concerned, we'll fight for every reform, every little gain we'll fight for. But we also know the capitalists will give with one hand, they'll take with the other. It won't be long lasting. And therefore, and people learn from this struggle. Consciousness changes on the basis of struggle. And people are learning even in the Labour Party and the Union. And we, they've only begun this journey, actually. And they're going to draw some very, very radical conclusions that they don't even dream about today. And that's particularly amongst the youth. And of course, we are critical of those. Of course, we don't, we don't pose things in a, a negative way. We try and be positive and explain, you know, which way, why we should take over the giant companies, the banks, and so on in Britain to plan the economy. Because you can't control or plan what you can't control. You can't control what you don't own. It's as simple as that. How many Labour governments have tried to control things but they try, by, by bribing the capitalists? It's all failed. And that's where the mess we are now. I mean, the rational clause for is it, it raised the idea of common ownership. That's all. It's true, though. You know, Marxists didn't write it. It was written by Fabians, under the pressure of the working class, by the way. 
and expressing the idea of common ownership was an early, which was an earlier demand, if you like, in the, in the movement. And we supported common ownership, but we translate it into words, on, into a program. In other words, we talk about read social appeal, nationalize the 100 major monopolies, the banks and insurance companies, the land, take it over, expropriate. We're not going to pay compensation to the, the fat cats. The hell with them. They've had enough of it. And have workers' control and workers' management of the economy. That's the way we offer. In other words, we have translated the words of Clause 4 into the realities of today. And we use that in order to explain what we are all about, what real socialism is. The basis, of course, we're in favour of MPs on what? 85,000 a year? You must be bloody joking. Like trade union leaders, they should be on the same wages as the workers they represent. They should be on the wages of ordinary workers. Otherwise, they're there as the bloody careerists. And we're against careerism. Uh, you know, we could change the old bloody constitution of the Labour Party. There's loads of things I like to put in it. Uh, but uh, all I'm saying is, we have to fight where we can fight and where we get an echo and where we can raise these ideas because they are most relevant. And yes, I agree with the speaker at the back. Marxism approaches the youth in particular. Marxism makes you young. Look at me, for Christ's sake. I'm only 21. <laughs> I'm a year younger than Dora. Uh, but the point is that, yes, these ideas give you an understanding instead of walk, feeling in the bloody dark and where the hell are we go in. Because it shines a light on where we go in. What is possible? And to understand the movement of history and the class struggle, which the reformers do not do. They do not see it in class terms, which we do, and understand the movement of the working class. And at the end of the day, it is the working class who are going to change society, and they are the ones who will move to change society. But leadership is critical. You know, someone mentioned the Russian Revolution. You know, the, the ruling class in Russia and the general staff in Russia were terrified when there was one Bolshevik in a regiment. Why? Because that one Bolshevik could articulate the feelings and the aspirations of the people in that, in that regiment in the same way that we will be able to articulate the feelings of young people and workers in struggle itself. But to do so, we have to train ourselves. We can't teach without learning. We have to, if like, conquer the ideas of Marxism, conquer these ideas to be able to explain and perspectives and ideas to workers themselves. That's a great job, but look, history is, has reached a critical point here. But the, the whole situation is on a knife edge. I'm not saying like tomorrow at 9 o'clock, the revolution, but over the next year, two, three, four, five years, Look at the international situation. China's in crisis now with this collapse of this property company. It's going to, uh, this could be like a new uh, uh, Lehman Brothers in the United States. Where you had the, the, I mean, all these, all these contradictions are, are building into this dynamite, into the foundations of British society, the sleepy little Britain. And therefore, we're going to play a vital role. If we understand, we need to build the forces of Marxism. For when the working class moves, we're able to link our struggles with their struggles, that we are with them. We offer a way out and therefore articulate the way forward for the working class itself. And if we have that ability, then we can change society. It's up to us, comrades. No one else is going to do it. And therefore, we have to rise to the occasion. And this is just, this is a flash in the pan, I would say, this conference. Here we slipped upon yesterday, but, and the big but is, what the future holds, and the future doesn't hold stability for the right wing. It's all, it's, it holds enormous crisis for the working class, and therefore the organizations of the working class, which are going to be turned upside down. And therefore the opening of our ideas, that's our time. The chorus, let's rise to the occasion, build our forces, and prepare the way for the socialist transformation of society in Britain and internationally. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.